Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about ways for journalists to incorporate technology into their storytelling. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. We serve journalists in the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking about the marriage of technology and journalism. Two journalists from Gizmodo won NPS Technology and Journalism Award by exploring the explosion of internet-connected devices in our homes and the implications for privacy. With me in the studio today are Kashmir Hill and Saria Matu. Thank you both for joining us today. So, why don't, you, why don't we start with giving me some background about your role in the project that won the award um, titled The House That Spied on Me. How did, where did the idea come from? The idea came from, Saria and I were having coffee um, in a park in New York and we were talking about how the FCC uh, had passed these privacy rules that were going to keep internet service providers from being able to look at your internet to activity and monetize it. And we were thinking like, how can we write about this in a way that makes people understand it and care? Because uh, it's yeah. kind of this wonky policy thing. And I think, I think you came up with the idea. You're like, yeah, I remember the question we were trying to answer was, can we determine how often the devices we have in our homes are speaking to the companies that made them? as a kind of entry point into this investigation. I think that was it, right? I think, well, yeah, I can't, yeah. I can't remember now. It was so far, it was so long ago, but I think we wanted to know, like, if an ISP is looking at a house, right. what does it see? What kind of data is coming out of that house? What would they learn about the people who live there? Um, and so then we came up with this idea of how, how is that going to change? What is it going to look like in the future when we have even more connected devices in our home that are sending way more data about us? And so we decided let's make a smart home and let's spy on it spying on us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you think people understand that all of these devices are actually sending information back to the manufacturers or the companies? Absolutely not. I think they, they must know that there's something happening because they know they're connected to the internet, right? So there's, but, but I think like the ways in which it actually works is, is not clear. So it's like you're just connected to the cloud where people's kind of mental model of what that means I think is different to the reality of what these devices actually do. Mm -hmm. I love, it's, at some point there was this, um, somebody looked very closely at a privacy policy for a smart television and in it it said, don't say anything too sensitive around your television because there's microphones in the television. And this was shocking to people because they just didn't think about the fact that their TV was watching them back. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I really don't think people understand that. Um, no, when you say it's in the policy, is it is it actually in any kind of paperwork that the consumer purchases? Uh, it's in those wonderful privacy policies that come with, you know, every mm -hmm. device and every service we use. That you have to click, I agree? Right. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> it's, a, sometimes it's just there and you don't even mm -hmm. click, I agree. But yeah, most of us just, you know, there's, there's 44 pages of terms of service to read. And so you just say, I agree and move on. And that's how privacy law works in the United States, <laughs> where you live in a, you know, a consent environment where you're always mm -hmm. saying okay to these things and then they're allowed to do what, what they've written there. And unfortunately, no one's reading it. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you two actually pair up on this? You said you had coffee, but were you both working in the same office at that time? Or, I mean, how did Gizmodo come to have you know, a, an engineer with the skills that Saria has? So I was already um, working sort of in journalism, I, I, my background's in engineering, but I found myself into this sort of storytelling and investigative. I, I didn't think of it as journalism when I started doing it, but it made it made logical sense to do it as a part of a uh, journalism organization. So before Gizmodo, I worked at ProPublica, and then I came to Gizmodo because I knew Cash was there, and worked, and she's seen a lot of Cash's reporting before, and knew that she was someone that I could pair up with and do kind of interesting storytelling around technology. Mm -hmm. And tell us a little bit more about your beat, Kashmir. Um, sure. And yeah, I would just say that Gizmodo uh, Media Group decided to form this investigative team okay. mm -hmm. um, assembled by our former editor, John Cook, um, who's since left. But he had this idea of let's have a bunch of journalists and have Surya, a technologist, who can help them probe these things that they otherwise can't explore just by asking questions. Um, this came to be my beat. Um, 
I I went to journalism school and decided to they at NYU they encouraged us to develop a niche as a journalist mm -hmm. and I decided to focus on privacy and I started a little blog like on Google Blogspot or whatever called the not so private parts um, and I had worked at a law firm and so I was mostly writing about the intersection of privacy and law but it kind of forced me to start covering technology because technology was just eroding privacy everywhere I looked. And so I ended up learning a lot about technology and I really love first person journalism. Um, so I was coming up with ideas about how to use the technology myself and I just started pairing with technologists on different projects that I did. Um, and I just found that you know, it helps when you're writing about technology to be working with somebody who really understands it at the technological level. Um, and yeah, so I was really excited to get to work with Surrey Ambia and be on this team. Mm -hmm. Well, it's wonderful that Gizmodo and ProPublica have technologists on their staffs. How many newsrooms do, I mean, do you, would you guess? I mean, it would seem like it's a small number to me, but um, I mean, how it seems incredibly important as time goes on that journalism and newsrooms work with technologists and so that they can do algorithms and the type of work that you did for this project. I think it's it's slowly increasing. I think over the last, I mean, Cash can speak to this more because she's worked in more newsrooms. At least from from my perspective, I've noticed what used to happen is that people who did data journalism were basically they, the data journalism was thought to be data visualization which means that they came from the graphics desk and kind of made the charts that went with stories and analysis. But what's really the trend that seems to have changed in the last few years is that we've kind of gone more towards data-driven investigations. And I think that's kind of what's coming up now. So the, in New York, I, I've seen a few newsrooms that are, that are doing this, like BuzzFeed has one, Gizmodo has one. Um, the New York Times obviously has one, the Washington Post. So the big, the big publications all do, but even in the smaller ones, I see this coming up just because like technology is pervasive. So it makes sense that you need people who can speak tech natively to be able to help find the stories within it. I do think it's hard to say because a lot of times technologists are invisible labor on right. stories mm -hmm. and they're not always named. They're certainly not on the byline uh, and so yeah, I think it's hard to say how many newsrooms actually have them, and I think that they should be. One thing we tried to do with this story, when I first was writing it, I was like, how am I going to make Surya part of this byline? Because it was like I lived in the smart home, and I realized, oh, we can do it as two people. They're telling the tale. Like, I'm the person living in the home, and Surya is the person watching mm -hmm. me. Um, so that he was kind of um, uh, be becoming the house in a way, um, <laughs> personifying the house. And But I think a lot of times people aren't really... Um, including the technologists kind of in the byline field, which I think they should definitely be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of this story. So, um, Kashmir, why don't you first talk about the devices that you settled on and why those devices? So I was, I was trying to be just a normal person who would be trying to create a smart home. So I was thinking, you would probably want to get cheap devices, you just want to get popular devices. So essentially I headed to Amazon.com and Wish.com and just started looking for a smart anything. Um, and yeah, we, I think we just like created an Excel sheet and just started listing all the crazy yeah. smart devices we could find. And what we thought would be leaking data, so buying yeah. like some good products and some cheap products because like often the cheaper products are the, the grosser products as we kind of call them. Mm -hmm. um, so we had, we had like 25 or 30 actual devices originally, right? And we cut down from there. Yeah, and so I just started, um, and some, some devices I already had in my home, embarrassingly for <laughs> privacy journalists, we already had an Amazon Echo. Mm -hmm. We already had a, a smart TV. Um, we, and so, yeah, and I started reaching out to some companies to see if they would provide the devices to us. And in some cases, they did. And in some cases, said, well, what is this, what is this for? And uh, for example, um, iRobot, the, mm -hmm. that makes robot vacuums. When they heard what the story was about, they said, no, we would not like <laughs> to send you one. So, um, so we had a uh, you purchase we, we that purchased one. <laughs> we purchased some devices and mm -hmm. got some from companies to to trial. Mm -hmm. And so you went from twenty five to thirty that you might want to use to what was the number in the end? It was eighteen. Eighteen. Uh huh. And why don't you between the two of you, you may, might be able to remember mo what most of them were, so that people can understand how yeah. basic these were. I mean, the toothbrush was the one that surprised me. Who needs a smart toothbrush? <laughs> Who wants smart dental insurance? <laughs> Yeah, there is dental does. insurance now that 
they'll monitor how often you brush to set your rates. Um, <laughs> so do. okay, so smart toothbrush, smart TV, smart sm mattress, smart mattress, um, like mattress cover, um, smart speaker. We get a lot of those um, plugs, smart those plugs. Plugs, the smart plugs, smart light bulbs, Alexa, smart speaker, speaker, speaker. Um, mm -hmm. the coffee machine, smart coffee machine. Um, I don't remember what I saw. The sex toy, <laughs> the sex toy. Because <laughs> I had written before about sex toys that leaked that leaked data to their manufacturers. Barbie, smart toys. Smart. I have like a couple of smart toys for my daughter. Uh. Um, Trying to remember, we did a video where we like right, had them stacked, stacked up the Roomba, all the boxes. The, the smart vacuum. You know, that's the vacuum, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are all things that normal people would have in their houses. Maybe not all of them. Yeah. But not, not yeah, every yeah. Every <laughs> and probably not realizing <laughs> what kind of information right. was, you know, coming out of those. And Suri, why don't you describe what kind of information was being sent back to the companies or the manufacturers? So for most, most of the data we collected um, was encrypted, which is good, as it should be, because um, these devices were using sort of, most of the devices I would say were using HTTPS, which is like the kind of baseline encryption that you use these days. But so there were some that were really, really bad. The smart TV was the worst one, which, which I could see when they were watching, what TV shows they were watching. Uh, on Hulu and Netflix, and it's, it's kind of interesting because it's not that there was, the only reason I could see that is because it was a third party tracker that was on the Hulu site, on the Hulu like um, splash page that was sending data to itself unencrypted. So often you find sort of the vulnerabilities by looking at the, the weakest link in the network. So it was a company, I think it was Scorecard Research was the one, and you could see that they were just sending the data of like what they were clicking on the remote through. So there was that, but there was other stuff too where I could, I could tell from patterns of devices when they were being used or not, and that kind of gave me kind of meta information about the household. So I knew when they watched TV because I could see the traffic coming through that device. I knew when Kashmir brushed her teeth. I knew when uh, when she was putting her kids uh, left to bed because they could you could see her using the smart speakers um, lullaby service, mm -hmm. and there were all of these sort of like different anecdotes that came out, which I think is was kind of the goal of the story. It wasn't to sh say that these are security vulnerabilities and like the Russians can come and hack you or someone like you know your neighbor can come and hack you, but this is kind of the ambient emissions of your smart home. And your ISP is collecting all of this, and they can, and they are legally allowed to monetize it. Mm -hmm. And why don't you describe how you were able to get this information from all of these devices? Sure. So what I did was I made a, I made a special router using sort of off-the-shelf hardware. We actually wrote a follow-up piece that describes uh, how I did it with the code that goes with it for anyone who wants to try it out. But basically, I made a router using um, a thing called a Raspberry Pi, which is an off-the-shelf computer that's really cheap to buy. And essentially, the router the the router acted sort of like a release uh, kind of a what, how do you call it like a gossipy doorman, you know? It's just like every packet that was going through the device, it was just making a note of it and saving it to a file. And I would just have the doorman send me the files every six hours. So <clears throat> there was a constant sort of uh, update of what was happening in the data, and I could see it remotely in New York, because I lived in New York and Cash was in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So it was essentially, it wasn't very sophisticated in terms of the complexity. This was all off-the-shelf hardware and software that you could use. Um, mm -hmm. It was just that we did it in a way that um, allowed us to monitor all the traffic that was going through in a way that Cash could see it as well. So there were often times, especially when we were starting off and we were trying to figure out what data mapped to which device, and then she and I could kind of, we were on the phone and be like, oh, play with this thing. Play with the coffee machine. She's like, okay, I'm turning on the coffee machine. And then, we, so we could do those kinds of experiments, mm -hmm. which also helped. Mm -hmm. So uh, this question is actually for both of you, but what was the most interesting thing you found during the reporting phase while you had all of these devices in your home? I mean, I think it was the, I think it was the leakage around the TV. Yeah. Both the, one, I discovered that my Vizio Smart TV had been capturing everything that we watched over um, over the years that we had bought it and that the FTC had actually cracked down on the company for doing this by default. 
Um, and so I, through the reporting, through the traditional reporting phase, I discovered, oh yeah, I had a very privacy invasive television. But then through the technological analysis, we saw that there was still data being leaked. And it was just, it was really surprising. Um, on New Year's Eve, my husband and I stayed in and we watched a DVD on the TV. So I just thought there's no internet involved there. But Surya knew that yeah. we had been home watching TV on New Year's Eve. And so that, it was just a surprise to me. Yeah. Even as much as I know about these things. Yeah. And that was the thing for me too. Is when I was going through the, like I didn't know when you, when you do these sort of investigations, <clears throat> you really don't know what you're going to find and you sort of are like, I think of it as going on a vision quest and you're like wandering through and hoping something kind of pops at you. But what really struck with me was how I could determine the, the patterns of their lifestyle. And that's the kind of stuff which is really what advertisers are eventually interested in. They don't, care, they don't necessarily care what you're watching if they can tell when you watch it because there's other ways for them to determine that as well. And I think that, that, that's what really struck out for me was I could really, I, I, got, like, I, could, I could tell, I was like, ah, oh, they stayed in for New Year's, right? Mm -hmm. and like, or like they, or they went out on, on that they were really binge watching some TV show on a particular day. Mm -hmm. But, to, was, but yeah. to be perfectly candid, when we first, the night before we were gonna publish this, we were both like, wow, this isn't a very good story. Yeah. We didn't find anything shocking. Mm -hmm. We thought we'd find something like, really horrible happening yep. in my home. But we didn't, and a lot of the most horrible things were examples that have come up with other products that I was just reporting on. Um, so we were really surprised and yep. pleased when people liked the story so much, and it told me, wow, people don't really understand mm -hmm. the data that's leaving their home. This is, this is surprising to them, even though nothing shocking happened to me. My house didn't do anything horrible to me over this, you know, month-long period. People just didn't know that the data was leaving their home. And uh, we should talk about what did the what did the companies do with this information? I mean, were you able to understand that on a device by device basis, or is it just that you know it from your reporting that they use it for marketing and and um, manufacturing. Yeah, I mean, what's hard is we can't know what's done with the data after it's taken from us. Mm -hmm. So I can only point to um, times where we do know. So um, one of the reasons why we bought a sex toy, I didn't I didn't use it in part because, you know, I knew Surya was watching everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the sex toy manufacturer uh, based in Canada had a smart sex toy that people could use like if they were in a long distance relationship and connected to Bluetooth. And the manufacturer had been collecting all of this data from it about when it was turned on, how hot the device got, what the settings were. And they were looking at this data. Um, they were collecting it. Uh, so some security researchers realized, they reached out to the company and said, why are you collecting this data? And he said, well, it's great for market research. Mm -hmm. So they were like, they were, data mining people's orgasms to mm -hmm. come up with better devices, which, um, you know, maybe that's fine. Maybe it's great to have better devices, but people didn't realize um, that that data was being collected. And that's, that's really <laughs> right. sensitive data. Mm -hmm. um, we know with uh, smart television, because there was that FTC settlement with, with Vizio, that mm -hmm. that was data that was being, you know, sold to, to marketers and, and data brokers. So I think that's where the data is going a lot of the time. Um, I mean, is that, and, and there's also, products that the, the companies themselves will make in the future where you use this data as the sort of um, the raw materials to, from which to build the algorithms or the data models from. And it's really hard for us to know explicitly without the companies telling us because we can't like do like a freedom of information request to like Facebook's databases, which mm -hmm. I wish we could <laughs> make one a lot easier. But, um, but I think because of that, the best we can do is provide clear and concrete examples of what is happening. Mm -hmm. Because as Cash said, when we wrote the story, when we did the investigation and, and the data we had, I remember both of us being like, yeah, everyone knows this. We really kind of believe like there's nothing that we're reporting on that's that new. I thought the stuff we found was interesting and like, I was surprised that I could tell that much, but it wasn't, in my mind, new information. It was sort of things that people knew about like metadata that even came up after like Snowden. Mm -hmm. uh, and like what metadata can reveal about you. But yeah, I, I guess people don't know. And it, just, it, was, like, it was kind of shocking how, how much it landed and how little people realized mm -hmm. uh, this was happening. Mm -hmm. Were there, you mentioned the TV, were there other devices that you thought were over the top in terms of the amount of data that they were collecting or their ability to collect data? I imagine that some devices or manufacturers are more sophisticated than others. The coffee machine was pretty chatty, right? I think we are, I, I was most surprised by um, the Amazon Echo, mm -hmm. just because yeah. the Echo is supposed to be just kind of like 
chilling there until you say the wake word, whether it's mm -hmm. Alexa or computer or Echo. But um, Surya discovered that it was, you know, pinging Amazon servers every minute. Every three minutes. Every mm. three minutes. Mm. And so I was just surprised that there was that much background activity happening, given that we weren't, you know, given that we weren't using the device. And, that, that and that's surprising. sort of the, and I think that's where, like, there's a lot of room for, like, the journalism and storytelling in this. It's like, it's not necessarily that they're doing anything nefarious. Mm. But if, they, if people have this mental model of, why is a device pinging home every three minutes? And the engineers who are making it can think about that and be like, hmm, maybe we should be more careful when we're writing these programs and think about these other implications so that we don't do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the room is. It's not that these people are necessarily bad. The engineers who are making this are just trying to make sure that the products work. Mm -hmm. It's not like they are necessarily trying to collect the data. They just want these things to have like a seamless experience. Mm -hmm. And when you're making some, aiming to make something have a seamless experience, you tend to over-engineer it just to make sure it does everything. But then that comes at the cost often of privacy and um, safety. Mm -hmm. In your reporting, did you contact any of the companies and ask them what they were doing with the information or how much data they were collecting in sort of a macro sense, not just necessarily your household? <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, we reached out to all the companies. We asked mm -hmm. Amazon, for example, you know, why, how, why the Echo was so active in the background. Um, and I think we include everything in the story that they are willing to say mm -hmm. on the record. A lot of these technology mm -hmm. companies don't like to have on the record discussions. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we reached out to everybody. And I, again, I don't think there was anything really nefarious happening in our house. I, we were surprised that there was this bleeding of what we were watching and seeing on TV. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just because that is potentially kind of very revealing. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't think those companies uh, back to us. I mean, Netflix was sending the images unencrypted, yeah. and then Hulu had these two yeah. data Hulu brokers the, yeah, that was, on, yeah, that was the worst one, because yeah. Hulu actually had a third-party tracker on mm -hmm. your TV monitoring what you're watching and sending it home. And Hulu never responded to us. Right. Mm -hmm. And what was the impact on your family, Kashmir? <laughs> You've got a... Uh, <laughs> oh, that was, that was one of the connected devices. So we had a mm -hmm. camera mm -hmm. and um, air quality monitor. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to Europe during this period to go speak at a conference in Barcelona. And I'd had the camera, like, set up in our, in our living room. And, you know, I was flying out of the country. At the first stop, I went to check the camera. And I could see my husband, like, in the kitchen with my daughter making coffee. And then all of a sudden, the camera shut down. And <laughs> I... I reached out to him. I was like, hey, it looks like the camera's not working. He was like, it was watching me make coffee. It was really creepy. And I was like, well, can you turn it back on? You know, we're monitoring the data flows. And he's like, okay, okay. And it did not get turned back on while I was in Europe. Oh. He, he just didn't like kind of being spied on. And I understood that. So, um, yeah, I would say one thing I became very aware of is that when you make your house smart, you know, it's spying on you, it's spying on the people you live with, it's spying on everybody who comes into your house. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, some people that come over to our house like hate that the Echo is there and they'll unplug the Echo to have conversations with us because mm -hmm. they just, they don't want Amazon listening in the background even if it supposedly is only waking up when it hears its wake word. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do think that's one of the challenges of these technologies is that we, we are trusting what the company is telling us the device is doing. And a lot of us who are not technologically savvy don't have a way to check it, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's so important for journalists to work with technologists like Surya so that we have a way of, of fact-checking the technology, mm -hmm. which is something you can't always do just by questioning the company because you don't always get a straight answer whether because they don't know um, or whatever mm -hmm. other reason they might not <laughs> tell you the truth. Well, let's talk about consumers a little bit. So did you learn anything in the course of the reporting of this project um, about um, hygiene practices that normal device owners can practice to avoid or at least diminish the amount of data that's being sent back to companies? You know, sort of like you can do with your phone or with encrypted devices that you use to contact sources. It's a little harder with smart, smart home devices simply because... Um, we haven't, there hasn't been a big story yet about like a vulnerability being found that caused someone damage in their personal life. Um, but I think like our story actually kind of alluded to it could happen. So I imagine it's, I mean, the same, this is the same sort of techniques. They don't, they're not quite there yet, but you sh there should be ad blockers for your smart homes and there should be. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of um, software me mechanics that also can operate in the home, but they aren't yet. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that's kind of like super terrifying in what security researchers have been warning about for a long time, which mm -hmm. is that, okay, so everything's connected to the internet, but when everything's connected to the internet and it's not as sophisticated as your laptop or your smartphone, those things are incredibly vulnerable to attacks that have been, that are known and well documented. So mm -hmm. if you have like a botnet army, which is just basically a fancy way of saying a, a program running wild on the internet just looking for vulnerable devices. Mm -hmm. These devices open up your home to those sorts of vulnerabilities. Um, and yeah, I, I can't think of anything that's, that's out there that's at least the norm, but I would say question why you need a smart device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, smart homes are still too new for there to be a lot of um, kind of reactive, protective technology developed, but I would say that it is being developed right now, and I know that there are both companies and academics that are working on tools that will let you monitor your own smart home <laughs> by essentially um, c c kind of connecting to the router, and it'll tell you, okay, this device is active, this device is connecting to these endpoints, and so it will be a way for you to see, oh, it sent this, this device is sending data when I don't expect it. Um, or this device is sending a lot more data than I would expect, given that it's not a video camera. Mm -hmm. um, so those are in development, but there's not a lot that's available yet. But I would say it's like coming very soon. Mm -hmm. Right. So over this over a month, you said, right? Mm -hmm. You collected all of this data. You had all of this information. And um, how did you decide how to tackle the assembling of the journalism itself? Clunkily, is <laughs> sort of how I remember We brought in it. another technologist, yeah. Drew Marotra, mm -hmm. who yeah. helped us like create a database yeah. to make sense of the data. Yeah, all so the data we collected. That's how we did it. We first collected all the data. We had um, we had Drew make the database and sort of an API that allowed me to query it. And from that, I built us a little interface to that database mm -hmm. that Cash and I could both look at so we could basically pick different devices and see what they were doing. And that's when I learned that I could tell when Cash is brushing her teeth because I was able to see when you we were like having like a remote meeting one day, uh, when, when, the, when the data was going over this one device and it became sort of clear just by our interaction that, oh, she had not brushed her teeth before this meeting we had. And mm -hmm. it was, those sorts of things became clear when we had a, a, like a, a interface, a user interface that we could look at the data with in real time. Like, I knew on my side I was going to do a story that was both my lived experience of just kind of, I mean, this was supposed to be a story about data, mm -hmm. but on the live side of it, I would just discovered that living in a smart home was terribly inconvenient and was just a nightmare. So I knew I had a lot of funny material about how horrible it was to live in a smart home. So I knew that that would be like a narrative thread that would kind mm -hmm. of keep people going. And then I'd done a lot of research about you know, products that had already been problematic in terms of data leakage. So I had um, just a collection of historical and legal problems. I had my lived experience, and I asked Surya, you know, what did you learn about me, and what were the most horrible things you saw in the house? <laughs> um, and so essentially we took those, like, three or four categories of information and then wove them into right. a story. Mm -hmm. Right, and it was, yeah, it was easier because when you started kind of writing the narrative like as a two-person thing, it became easier to just describe what I actually found rather than trying to figure out what the purpose of it was. And I think a lot of it would have actually gotten left out if you didn't come up with the idea of the two-person narrative because it would be like, there's no new information in this. There's no reason to bring it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I asked like how to best visualize what you were seeing. And so Surya like took all of the, the Netflix images that he had been seeing go across the transom. So that said, that that was revealing about us because it said what Netflix thought we would want to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we put that together into this like image grid that we include in the story. Yeah. And then we did charts that showed like mm -hmm. how often devices were active over the month. Um, the, cra the crazy thing you told me is that the smart home was never quiet. Yeah. There was never a time when there was no data coming out of the house. Even when we were gone for a week, mm -hmm. there was still data yeah. flowing out of the house. And so mm -hmm. it was just little observations like that right. that we were able to pull out to Make so people the big understand one, it. The big one was your that I was surprised by was knowing what apps were on your phone. 
Oh yeah, but we didn't even write about that. We didn't, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we didn't even get to that. Uh, but I could tell what apps were on Cash's phone just because of the way, um, again, it's just these images and icons that get sent and those tend to be unencrypted mm -hmm. because the companies think that there's no metadata in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we ran into other stories while doing this story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You've got a full menu of things yeah. to follow up. <laughs> yeah. right. um, are there, is there anything in your reporting, either on the technology side or, the, or the, the, the traditional journalism side, that you think would be helpful to other journalists? I mean, the whole point of this tutorial is to help other journalists learn from what, what you guys um, did over the course of a month. I mean, the best lesson I can give another journalist is find a technologist like Sir had a partner <laughs> up with. Um, and then, I mean, I think you have very concrete things you can do as a technologist to do a story like this. But I just, it just opens up all kinds of new reporting avenues mm -hmm. to be working with a technologist and think about there's this, there's this thing I want to investigate. Um, I know the traditional ways I would do it, but what are the technological ways? And it's just, it's helped me mm -hmm. on so many stories to have uh, a person who could query databases um, and collect data in ways I just I cannot do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think that sort of it is like get someone who speaks the language natively um, because I think that's what people who like people like me who've been kind of in the space of trying to understand how technology impacts society and are thinking about it from that lens. Um, what you end up doing often is you'd be like, okay, if this sort of if this system works in this way, it means the person who made it is making these assumptions because that and that's what I think a technologist can give you that you can't get from traditional reporting structures is you know the, the sort of the pipeline in which how things are made and that gives you avenues to, the, to understand where the interesting questions could be so that's why when we started the, even the smart home story I knew that we wouldn't be able to get all the data because getting all the data would be too hard it would not really work and it would be bad because you'd be like breaking um, encryption on a lot of these devices in a way that we shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. So the more important story was the ambient, the ambient emissions of the home and what what it smells like, not what it like exactly descriptively looks like, because people just don't even have that information. And I think we're finally getting into a place where there seems to be public interest for those those sorts of anecdotes and those sorts of stories. So yeah, I get people who know how to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So after you published, um, describe some of the impact that the project had in terms of either readers or um, you know the technology community, just I, anything. I yeah. know that the story definitely inspired other projects to help people monitor their smart homes, mm -hmm. um, things that are still they're still going to be coming out. Um, and it just was like really widely read. Yeah. We did a lot of radio interviews. Yeah. Ted asked us to turn it into a TED Talk. Um, a lot of conferences yeah. like wanted us to come and talk mm -hmm. about it. It was just a really, I think, good way to for people to understand what Internet of Things means for our data and our privacy. And it was just this very concrete way to talk about it as here's an actual home right. where we we found out how much the smart home talked to the internet. And I think the and I think like from the people I spoke to, whoever I spoke to after, to whoever sent us comments. The thing that kind of really came through, which is what we hoped for or when we wrote it, was people kind of understood that the, the value that these devices are getting, giving us in, in, our, in our smart homes, the trade-off amount of data we leak doesn't seem to really be at a point where, they make, where it makes sense to have them. Like They just aren't giving us enough benefit. That it, mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, so they don't really work the way you think they do. And also, they seem to be leaking all this data, so maybe I'm just going to wait for a bit. Mm -hmm. And like that for me is like impact. <laughs> like if I can just make you not. You might have but. changed a few like yeah. birthday wish lists. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, in terms of the, um, uh, was there any pushback from the companies after publication? No one uh, wasn't. There was something with the coffee machine, right? but I can't remember what it. Oh, you know, one big concrete change was. Asking, so my, I made my coffee maker and my Amazon Echo talk to each other, but to be able to get it to make coffee in the morning, you had to say, like, hey, be more run quick start, um, which was something we just could never remember in the morning uh, before we'd had our caffeine. And so the company changed the prompt <laughs> into, like, hey, be more, make me coffee, or something <laughs> like that. But I don't think we had anybody push back on anything that was in the story. 
Okay. Well, because I don't think we revealed anything that the company, the companies, I think, were like, yeah, we 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 do this. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is this is how this is how this works. But I don't think people understood that. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else that would be of interest to journalists about your reporting or the technology in this project? The only thing I don't think we talked about is that Surya did he built he like built a router for me mm -hmm. on a Raspberry Pi that we installed in my home. Yeah. Um, and so there was like a hardware kind of component to this. Uh, mm -hmm. Which we'll which we'll put in the we can put the code of how you build that router yourself in the resources. I can, you said that you wrote a story about it, so yeah. there's something that we can link to yes. from Gizmodo. Okay, we'll do that. Yeah. yeah. But, but the mm -hmm. thing about doing a story like this is you do have to trust the technologist you're working with, because mm -hmm. he really was seeing yeah. all the ambient data that was leaving my home. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you were. My, if my computer was attached to it, you were like seeing information about yeah. how I was navigating the internet and, and yeah, stuff I stopped like that, looking so. at you. I <laughs> filtered out your, your your computer from your phone from my little stream. I mean, the other thing that does come up though is that we took it for granted, but an important part of this is good communication between the technologist and the reporter because I think um, there's often there were there were times when I would go down a rabbit hole of something that was interesting technically for me to solve, but served absolutely no purpose in our story. Mm -hmm. And it was mm -hmm. helpful to like talk to Cash about it, and she'd be like, no, this is not, I don't understand why. Cool. It sounds cool. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. And we're like, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's no reason for us to be doing this. And being able to like talk, to work collaboratively on investigations like this, I think helped distill, it down, distill down the questions we're asking these technologies mm -hmm. and how they're impacting our lives and to, to get to something of substance. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, thank you. So our thanks again to Kashmir Hill and Surya Matu, the winners of the National Press Foundation's Technology and Journalism Award. Resources from this tutorial will be posted for your use on MPF's website at nationalpress.org, where we make good journalists better. <laughs>